Coming up on Theater Talk. You know, the, the idea is freedom. Freedom means I get to say what I want my life to be. I fight for gay marriage, not that I ever wanted to get married, but if you have the right to it, a heterosexual has the right, then I should have the right to it. Doesn't mean I have to do it. When straight people get married, now I have children, I go, oh, that's so gay. <laughs> From New York City, this is Theater Talk. I'm Susan Haskins. And I'm Michael Musto. So Michael, the wonderful play Torch Song is being revived off Broadway and we are so thrilled to have with us its beloved author, Harvey Firestein. <laughs> <laughs> its new star, Michael Yuri, recreating a role that was first played by Harvey Firestein but making it his own, and the director of this new production at Second Stage, Moises Kaufman. Congratulations, gentlemen. Great job. Yes, yes. Thank you. It was Torch Song Trilogy. It's now Torch Song. Yes. Because it's still, scales a, tri down. still are you gonna, a trilogy. Are you going to do a 20 minute version called Torch? Yeah. No, I, I and then a one minute version called Torch? Yeah. <laughs> he went for my joke. He went for my joke. Oh. <laughs> you know, this is how Conan O'Brien got off the air. <laughs> he is? Goes for the joke. I didn't even get the memo. <laughs> Harvey, okay, this play deals with adoption, bullying, the closet, drag. Nothing relevant to today. Right? <laughs> Back rooms. I was like, anonymous sex, exactly. I was amazed in seeing it, how relevant it still is to today. It doesn't even matter when it's set. All of those issues come to play in the modern LGBT movement. Yeah, the, the, the thing that I feel in the audience and the thing that I watch is, is this ownership of it. The audience almost feels like they own it. That, that um, I kind of wondered if it was going to feel old, you know, I mean, I'm old, why shouldn't it feel? But, but, um, but the, the, it, it's so alive, the audience is so alive with it. It means so much. I mean, to hear the audience cry more than they cried like at the original, uh, it's- And the you know, original, you start, you did the first of the trilogy in, in what, 79 at La Mama? Yeah, yeah. Se 78. Yeah, 78. 78, 78. Well, 78, 78. Was the international yes. now for, uh, oh. There it is. Wow. And you, and you make Which I post. hear was an anonymous sex bar in the village. Yes, it's now a friend. Uh, it's uh, now grinder, basically. Restaurant. No, it's a, it was a restaurant. Oh, it's a, well, don't order I the cream. I there. Don't order the cream I've sauce. Gone. I've gone. I've gone in there. I've, gone. I've sat down and gone. My children. <laughs> <laughs> That's the first of the trilogy, right. and then you have... Because Eric Conklin, the director of that, you know, I had to fight Ellen Stewart, La Mama, to give me the space, you know, because she didn't want me in drag anymore. It's a whole long story. But um, so, so um, when she finally said yes to putting on International Stud, he said, tell her it's a trilogy. And I said, well, look at that. He said, tell her it's a trilogy. That way we don't have to fight for a space next year. Oh, so uh, wow. so in, the, in the archives of the La Mama basement, the uh, Ozzy Rodriguez. The dazzling has, spot. The Lamar has the, he has the letter where I write, Mama, by the way, it's a trilogy. And uh, then I was stuck writing the other two. <laughs> <laughs> and that's how that's. Now, happened. Moises, how did, when did you first become aware of this play? Um, I think it was 1987. Um, I saw uh, the tour in San Francisco. And it was uh, a revelatory moment for me as well. You know, I was. Um, early 20s, I had come from Venezuela. Harvey insists that I'm Argentinian, even though I keep saying that I'm Venezuelan. <laughs> um, and uh, I had come from an Orthodox Jewish home in a very you know, Catholic and machista country. And uh, even though I felt that I was gay, I had no role models. I didn't know, you know that it was even possible. And so seeing this play and seeing all those different kinds of gay people up on stage opened the door and all of a sudden part of my life became possible. He was in San Francisco and didn't know it was possible to be <laughs> Obviously, he stayed in a room with no windows. <laughs> Obviously, he was from Venezuela. <laughs> now, what about you, Michael Yuri? When did you first become aware of this play? I read it in, a, uh, in high school in, uh, a cor uh, in a corner in the office of the drama department. I found it in the drama library and read it and devoured it, sitting by myself in a corner and didn't know so much uh, about the world until this play. And 
there, there were there were several plays at that you know in high school that that I because I was in drama I, I had this access to and uh, and that was one of them and 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 it was eye opening and then we got to perform them I mean I, I didn't do anything from Torch Song but I remember seeing scenes from it. Uh, were you out as a homosexual in high school? No. No. No, but you know I. I got the play, I understood the play, and I recognized myself in the play. It was an early eye-opening moment for me, and I never dreamed I would ever be in it. I never dreamed that I would ever play, especially that role. I, at that time, I probably thought maybe I could play Ed. Yes, yes. I could, I could see you seeing that, but, the, but you certainly get this role and make it your own, as I've previously said. Tell them that, that, that you got two calls about it. Well, yeah, so the first call was from, well, first I met Moises backstage at The Heiress, which he directed with Jessica Chastain, my school chum from Juilliard. And we met backstage, and I was a great admirer of his from Laramie and from uh, I Own My Own Life, and The Heiress was wonderful. And we became Facebook friends, and he reached out to me and said, I want to work together. I said, great, what can we do? And he said, what about Torch Song Trilogy? And I was like, okay. I never, and, I, and that was the first time I'd ever thought maybe I could really be in this. And, 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 um, and so we, we went back and forth. I read it again. We talked a little bit about it. And did he say to do Arnold? Yes, yes, yes. He, yeah. yes. he, he was, I, was, I thought of him as the mother. <laughs> <laughs> Moises had a different vision. He said, no, Michael Musto for the mother. <laughs> I don't think I'd be good for the mother. <laughs> <laughs> And anyway, this play, but wait, 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 you got you, but you got to Oh, okay, then what happens? Well, then a few then months, then what happens? you know, a few weeks then or months go by, and Richie Jackson, Harvey's manager, former assistant, former agent, uh, now producer, reached out, and he said, what do you think about Tort Song? And, and they, it was completely separate, independently of each other, these two men who I admired greatly. Yes. Yeah. Well, it's one of those things that they just happen sometimes. Yeah, so I said, you got to talk to Moises Kaufman because he had the same idea. And so they talked, and I guess the three of them met, and then they had me in to read the whole play, and that was that. And, and, and it, was, it was really the, these ideas, the ideas of two guys completely independently that came together, and the synergy of it ended up getting me the job. And it's like the kind of a thing that if I'd had to go in an audition, and prepare a few scenes, I wouldn't have gotten it. I, I, I would have failed. The play really combines something that is hilarious and heart-tugging at the same time. I mean, people are laughing and crying in the span of the two and a half hours. What did you cut along the way? I noticed one of the drag names, which is so brilliant. You, got, <laughs> you used to have Marsha Dimes. Marsha Dimes. But I, you still, you kept one. Birth of a Nation. I heard a great one on, on uh, Will and Grace the other night. Eileen Sideways? No. <laughs> Dora Jar? Judy-ism. Okay. <laughs> That's a good one. I thought that was a good one. Um, yeah, no, I... Um, but was it cut for the ADD generation or no, just... No, you know, the thing is that for many years, people um, have requested the rights to do the first play and the third play or the second play and the third or the first and the second. And um, and, I, and I would say, like, well, I can't... Well, we just can't do... And I said, you know, I wrote these plays for La Mama where you could do them just with chairs, you know, how much simpler. And I said, I'm going to have to cut them down to get it. That's, you know, and I, and I know the material so well. And I thought, let me try, let me try, you know, so, so that's what I did. It was sort of an experiment. I gave the play to Brian Kerwin, um, who, who played Ed uh, on the road and in, you saw him in San Francisco. And I also did the movie with him. I gave it to a bunch of people who had done the play and said, here, you read it. I gave it to the producers, to, to Lawrence Lane to read. And for the most part, they didn't know it was cut. They just, they couldn't actually, well, I think something from the, yeah. I think something. And, and as long as you miss nothing, it was fine. Is the, it true that Ethel Merman saw the original Torch Song trilogy? Yes, it is true. <laughs> that was so beautiful. I'm going to get a I dollar for that. I owe a dollar. What did she say? So she comes back. So first of all, she calls for tickets, right? Can I get a couple of tickets to that trigonometry thing? <laughs> so she comes to see the show, and she's coming down to my dressing room, and I'm like, fix up my robe, and I'm like, oh, oh my God. And I meet her out in the hallway. I'm that excited. I don't even wait till she gets to my dressing room. So, oh, Miss Murray, you know, I worship you. I am. So, I'm, I'm, oh, Miss Murray, yeah, I'm just so thrilled to find you. Meet you, oh my, and to, for you, and you came. So, what do you think, Miss Merman? And she said, and I quote, "I thought it was a piece of shit. and the rest of the audience laughed and cried. So what the f do I know?" 
Did you, Did you put that in the ads? Yeah. <laughs> it's better than Frank fab- Rich. That fabulous. She that tweeted fabulous. it later. She tweeted it. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, they, they, you, know, you talk about that. There was, um, there was the two women. That, we used to uh, like to listen to people in front of the theater. And these two women walking by, and they looked at me and went, if I knew Helen Hayes was in it, I would have seen it last year. <laughs> oh. no. Neil Simon's in this? Yeah. <laughs> Michael, you were great. And Mercedes Rule is also fantastic. Mercedes in the original Rule. production, which I'll never forget because it spun my little gay head around that somebody on Broadway was dealing with these issues of wanting acceptance as a gay man. It was extraordinary. Which had not time. been dealt with. But Estelle in Getty, back in the day. Estelle Getty was brilliant as mom. And she didn't win any awards. I don't know why she, I mean, she did win awards on the road. You know, when she went out of every, every town we went to, she won Best Actress. But I don't know why, um, I don't know why she was not nominated for awards. I mean, you know, Matthew and I won awards for it, but. but Matthew not, Broderick, she, yeah. But Matthew Broderick, uh, but she didn't. And, um, and she was bitter. <laughs> when she won, the, when she won the Emmy Award, she called me up and said, "I would have rather had the Tony." I said, "But I need so much bigger." B. Arthur would have rather she had the Tony instead of the Emmy too. <laughs> <laughs> I read Rue McClanahan's book. He's another. Ah, he's another whole story. But you, you listen, Estelle. Estelle and I had this relationship from the mama. Estelle used to come see all my plays, and she'd always say, "Put a mother in your next one. Put another. Put a mother in your next one." And I, and I, the idea of this woman who came up to my nipples. You know, uh, playing my mother. You know this little and um, and so I wrote the mother. You know, and she and she showed up and she showed up in her own clothes. In her, that was her wig. That was her clothes. Um, but the was, mo- the mother is tough and and She's and kind tough. of awful. Well, the but way she I, keeps I, saying, why I don't love you, you let me, Why don't you open your life to me? But whenever he does, she shoots him down. Well, but it, that's that's the mother relationship. But you know, I, I said to Mercedes, I said, you know. For all the years that torture has existed, women come up to me, 80-year-old women, they, they never say, that's me and my son. They always say, that's me and my mother. Oh. You know, they, I mean, that mother is so true to. And, and yet she, she is, does give that beautiful piece a, of advice. And yeah, you but, think but she, she could be a good mother. Let me she just tried talk hard. about Mercedes Rule because uh, she is, uh, uh, she, uh, she's a force of nature. Right. She's a force of nature, and, and she, she, unlike Estelle Getty, she completely transforms herself completely. into this other person. What was it like working with her to yeah. get her there? She's a, she's a stage animal. Every pore of her body, Argentinian, Argentinian uh, understands what it's like to be on stage. The moment she sets foot on the stage, if the transformation is there. She understands this character. Every thought that goes through her head is the character. It's, it's astonishing. You think it's so impossible? Believe me, one day you might meet a nice girl. Uh-huh. Michael, were you conscious of the fact that it's so etched in so many people's minds who didn't even see maybe the Broadway play, but they saw the movie, and you had to reinterpret it? And even if they didn't see the movie or the Broadway play, they have an idea of Harvey. People have this idea of him that, that, that they have cultivated from his work in movies, his, his, his writing, and his personality, and hairspray, and all these things that have come since Torch Song. So it, 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 I, I often feel like people don't, don't wonder uh, how I'll play Arnold, they wonder how I'll play Harvey, um, which is a totally different thing, because actually, I, I, Arnold is not Harvey. I mean, Ar- Ar- Arnold, of course, is... There's, there's, Arnold's in there, but Arnold's also in me. And so I can, I can find Arnold within me, and it doesn't have anything to do with Harvey, except but for But there the were Harvey a few creator. moments where I honestly thought you were channeling Harvey. Really? Yeah. And yet you were doing no kind of imitation. No, no not intentionally. People have to remember that I did write all of those characters. I mean, right. you yeah. know, I may have played Arnold, but, but, um, but I did write every one of them. But I want to go back, I want to go back to when you were in La Mama doing the international stud by yourself okay. on the stage and who you were when, that you came to write that play, that, you know, that then groundbreaking play. Well, about- Crystal Field called me to, for a one act for a festival she was mm-hmm. doing in 1975, mm-hmm. 76, the, for the Bicentennial, and I wrote the backroom scene for that. And I performed that all by itself. <laughs> and it was the hit of I the festival. I could imagine. Would, and so You're I, in an orgy, in a back room, a, a, a back gay, room. gay bar yeah, back room. Yeah. No, an orgy is like it's like arranged. <laughs> this is by chance. Well, this was before chance. Grinder, okay? This is, yeah. yeah, and this is. And, if Grinder was a room, it was a room where you're face to face, or a truck, or back to back, or a or truck. Or a truck. 
Um, <laughs> how did you stage that incredible scene where you are in the back room of the stud and having sex and speaking at the same time? It was, uh, we, it, it, the conversations were extremely funny. <laughs> the kinds of things you end up talking about when you're staging a scene like that are uh, pretty funny. And we would, often we would talk, we, I would do it, and then we would discuss it, and Moises would say, okay, you want to do it again? And I'd say, uh-uh. No. <laughs> no, no, by the end of it, I'm good, I'm good. He would say, I'm, I'm good. good, I'll think about it. <laughs> we'll do it again Your later. performance is so physical. Are you exhausted by the end of it, or are you adrenalized? But, but I'm more tired at intermission than at the end of the play, interestingly. Then you do um, your drugs. And then I, yeah, I have my powder <laughs> and I'm back. Um, but actually that's really, it, I, I was thinking about this just last night actually, as we were about to start the second act, I was like, gosh, I'm so tired. Mm. I'm, we're gonna have the whole, <laughs> got another mountain to climb. But that's actually where he is at you know, so much time has passed between the first and the second act, or the second play and the third play, I should say. And so much has happened to him. He's lost his partner. His partner has died. He's adopted a son. He, uh, he has grown up during intermission. So that weight, I feel like, is actually not that I'm physically tired. It's that, like, the first... And this is something that Harvey asked me on the first week. He said, have you felt yet how the plays inform one another? And I said at the time, no, <laughs> not yet. <laughs> um, but now I absolutely do. And they, they you know, it's a guy who, at the, when you first meet him, he's a kid. And by the end, he's a parent. It's wonderful to see the growth in Arnold through yeah. the years. He's still Arnold, but he has the power at the end to stand up to his mother. But because they're three plays and not three acts, which is why I would never take away the idea of, of, of it being a trilogy, that I take away the word, I took away the word trilogy because I didn't want people going, what time is this going to end? <laughs> That's right. Or he gets right. the car. <laughs> um, but, but uh, you know, in an act, an act can start right after the act you last saw. But the, because they're plays, they have beginning, middles, and ends. And you do have to, the exhausting part for this child is he has to rev up for, to do the first one. And then with no intermission, all of a sudden has to rev up again and do the second one. And so he's already done that twice. And that's like, and here comes the next mountain. And this mountain he knows is going to be, you know, the one that's going to kill him. And, yeah. you know, so, yeah. so there, is, there is that if you're an actor. But, yeah, all of this history, you walk on the stage with some, you know, I mean, I wrote that. You know, the first play, you're dumb alone because they're very young. When you're young, it's all about you, right? It's just you. And then the second play, it's you and your friends. And I wrote it, you know, Fugue in a Nursery. They're all in a giant bed together. You know, the room that we actually called the nursery, the sign on the outside said, bring your own bottle. And it was, you know, it was, it, it was a nursery. We were all growing up. We were experimenting. We were having sex with one another. We were finding out who we were. And then the world crashes in and reality crashes in. And that's the third play. That's Widows and Children First. And you can no longer deny your place in the world because stuff has happened to you. You're no longer, you know, what, what, do you remember Quentin Crisp said in, in Naked Civil Servant that uh, he had two friends over, a man and a woman over for tea and uh, left them in the living room, went into the kitchen, made tea. When he came back, they were having sex on the couch. And he said it was when I realized at this moment, I could no longer deny that I was in charge of the world. <laughs> you know, the, the life went on when I left the room, <laughs> you know, and it's, and it's like, that's what happens to Arnold, you know, and the stuff that's out of his control happens to him. And that's why that play looks realistic. But I, and I wrote it in this sort of Neil Simony kind of funny way, but he walks on with this incredible weight on him. He's a man who's mourning and the, this weight, and yet he has to be funny and he has to. As a, as a community, we've made so much progress through the years. I'm speaking of LGBTs, but now under President Trump, a lot of these rights are being repealed one by one. Does that inflame, I'm asking the three of you, inflame you with a rage like Arnold's rage, that I'm gay, just deal with it, what is your problem? Why can't I have equal rights? Yeah, you can't go back. You can't go backwards. I mean, the, the, you know, it's, it's, the real war was won before we had our rights. The real war was won when the American Psychiatric Association, I think that's the call, when they took away the designation of, of a that mental about illness. Now, when was that they did that? It was, in the 70s. It was after Stonewall. So, but it was, it was 75, I think. 73 or 75. Yeah, so, so you, there. So you, your play was, you were formulating your play then? Yeah. I but mean, I, did you, but did I, that's when I, uh, when I always said, from now on, it's going to be skirmishes. I always felt like, mm. you know, they used mm. to have those jokes about the, those poor Japanese soldiers that were out on some little island. <laughs> 
20 years after World War II, they were still waiting for the war to end. And I, and I, and I feel that way every time you see like an Anita Bryant or, or one of those people come out, you know, anti gay going, honey, the war is over. You didn't get the memo. You lost. Yeah. Yeah. You, lost. Yeah. you lost. So we will have these skirmishes and we will go backwards and forwards, but you can't go back because young people have come along and they're not as scared of us. They know who we are. They're not frightened. And your play came around after Stonewall, which was the monumental modern landmark right. of the gay movement, after gay was not no longer a mental illness. And Arnold just has this frustration, why aren't I there yet? Well, I think that, that watching the play for so many people, and people who have come back to see the play now, who saw the original, said that they had my experience, which is that it opened a door. That all of a sudden it was put on a Broadway stage. It was the first time that a character like this was starting on a Broadway play. But what has always struck me the most is that sometimes a play comes along that doesn't only predict what's about to happen, but also helps us construct it. By putting those images on stage of not only an out gay man, but a loving relationship between men, and a hate crime, and an adoption of a child, and two men having a child and having a family unit, he not only predicted the next 30 years, but he helped us envision it. We could do it in part because we had seen it. Did and you know that's what you were doing, Harvey Firestein? Hmm. No, because I did. I mean, you know, it's like I said about Catered Affair, you know, where, where one of the characters lives on the couch, his sister's couch, and when he's watching all this fighting, he starts realizing, I don't actually live on the, that's not my home. Mm -hmm. I'm on my sister's couch and needs to find his own life. And people say, well, that's a post Stonewall character. And I said, no, weren't we all brought up in the same families? We all, my, my, heterosexual brother and I had the same parents. We had the same, why shouldn't I want the same things? It, it struck me as strange. Thanks to the gallery players, the first gay people I knew were a gay couple that ran the theater that were together for 35 years when I met them. I didn't know that gay people were unhappy until I got it, took the subway to Manhattan. Mm. You know, I left Brooklyn, I went really? to Manhattan, I went, oh, we're supposed to be unhappy. Ooh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm kind of happy. Um, so I didn't know that was, that was not possible. I didn't, uh, it, it, so it, it just seemed to me, why shouldn't I want those things? And then I ran into, you know, people. <laughs> then you ran into, you no, ran you, into I the mean, third act. I, I was kicking around the mama when you first did the play, and you, man, most everybody was a gay man, but they're wretchedly unhappy for well, it, many, but, many Do you of remember, them. I mean, you were there, do you remember when we opened Tort Song? You know this, uh, the Village Voice, you were writing for the, for the, or the Soho News at that time. So, uh, 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 people like Edmund White, I mean, these gay leaders attacking me, saying, you know, he just wants us to be heterosexuals, and, you know, we just want our rights to have all the sex we want. You know, who, and it's like, you know, the, the idea is freedom. Freedom means I get to say what I want my life to be. I fight for gay marriage, not that I ever wanted to get married, but if you have the right to it, a heterosexual has the right, then I should have the right to it. Doesn't mean I have to do it, but it, that's what freedom means. Freedom it was almost means. a Stockholm Syndrome situation where a lot of gays, myself included, felt, oh, we're not gonna be subversive and edgy if we have the same rights as heteros. Right. I was too blindsided to not realize that, and of course, we should have the same rights. Yeah, and when straight Even if people, you don't want them for yourself. When straight people get married, now I have children, I go, oh, that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> we, have, we have one minute, Michael Musto. Do you want to sing a do song? Do your Mercedes rule. No. <laughs> <laughs> but you want to sing something. That's our next Moises segment. supposes his toes is a rose. Yeah, <laughs> that's what he wanted. That's what he wanted. It's an old Archin Argentinian, Argentinian song. Yeah. <laughs> Everyone knows it there. <laughs> Would you ever write a sequel to Tort Song Trilogy? You know, I, I don't know. I've, I've thought about it a lot. Arnold would be know. in Sage, I guess. I, yeah, well, um, you know, the, the guy that, that I had the relationship with, uh, you know, the, the Ed character, um, yeah, um, he, he visited me rather recently. And, mm. and um, Did you rekindle? He's a married man. He was married in the play, too, so what? <laughs> what is, what is it? Separated but not divorced. You never oh, know. That way lies madness. <laughs> yeah, there lies madness. Yeah. But it's very funny to think, you know, when he walks into the room, I have to deal with a certain reality, which is he's now 75. <laughs> you know, this, this, it, my international stud is now way past being a senior <laughs> citizen. You know, oh, tell, tell, tell him about the, what, what showed up at your dressing room. Oh, somebody, so in the, in the first monologue, in the first play, I talk about the guy 
the only guy that I really loved so far up until that point, uh, Charlie. He was everything you could want in an affair and more. Tall, handsome, rich, deaf. And someone sent me a photo of Charlie, of the real Charlie. Sent him a picture of the real Charlie. He passed away in 91. You know where we lived? We lived over the, it's now NYU, but over the, um, the Fillmore East. Oh, yes, of yeah. course. So Char Charlie and his two roommates, um, uh, uh, Sam, who was a dancer, who was a deaf dancer, you know, because they couldn't hear the music downstairs. I was the only one who sat up all night. Charlie was real and lovely. And handsome. And That's sweet. And very tall. I broke up his marriage. And he was a marriage And he's counselor. now 95 years old. He no, he's dead. Oh, he was a marriage count. Now, Torch Song is now at second stage until how long? December 3rd. December 3rd, and get over to see it, and this just should be seen over and over and go on and on. Thank you so much, Harvey Firestein, Michael Urey, and Moises Kaufman. Please say hello to your wonderful mother for me, who I met at your show. All right, thank you so much for being here on Theatre Talk. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Don't night. cry Thank for you, me, Michael Musso. Yeah, it's it's <laughs> <laughs> People change. They change. No, they don't. Oh, well, you think it's so impossible? Believe me, one day you might meet a nice girl. I'm ah. uh, just saying. You never know. Look at your friend Ed. He's separated. Separated, not divorced. <laughs> <laughs> Our thanks to the Friends of Theatre Talk for their significant contribution to this production. Theatre Talk is made possible in part by the Frederick Lowe Foundation, the Corey and Bob Dinelli Charitable Fund, the Noel Coward Foundation, Carrie J. Freeze, the Dorothy Strelson Foundation, and the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs. We welcome your questions or comments for Theatre Talk. Thank you.